My name is Mark Vieira. I'm Colorado Parks and Wildlife's carnivore and fur bear program manager here in Fort Collins. Um, I was a uh, area biologist for North Central Colorado for 16 years with the agency. And then I've been in this position um, the last four or five years. Um, I will say that bears and lions are probably um, the lion's share, if you will, of my workload. And then the fur bear species, of which we have 17 in Colorado, um, mostly carnivores, but in the case of beavers, obviously classified as fur bears, but, but not a carnivore, um, also responsible for those programs. We've, we've got some exciting uh, swift fox work we're doing. We're doing a, a, a pine marten density estimate right now in Colorado um, on the fur bear front. So um, some good stuff, some good stuff there. Um, I, I mostly handle the sort of um, fur harvest side of, of the management piece. So in preparation for today's talk, I definitely needed to, to reach out to different arms of the agency that, that all touch on, on beaver management. Um, that includes a, a lot of our, our regional uh, field staff, our DWMs, District Wildlife Manager, Game Warden staff, um, and that infrastructure that deals with a lot of the landowner um, and conflict removals and damage issues. Um, also talked to our, our wildlife health lab, um, and, and Corey touched on this a little bit, but even our aquatic veterinary health lab folks, um, kind of in preparation for this, for this conversation. Um, I, I can't really speak to the water policy piece for Colorado or some other things, so I'll, I'll mainly focus on uh, what Jerry had asked me to, to provide today, which is really a deep dive into our, our harvest management, harvest management regulations. Um, and then at the end of the talk, there'll be some time for Brian Sullivan, who's a Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, colleague of mine who runs our wetland program that also has a nexus with, with beaver um, to speak a little bit about, about his program, again, relative, relative to beaver. Um, I do really appreciate the opportunity to participate in the summit as a, a state uh, agency manager. Um, I acknowledged Jerry and Jamie yesterday and, and Corey's perspective, both from Afwa and from Idaho today. Um, I think the, the neat thing, the, one of the neat things I've picked up, and I was on the, on the webinar all day yesterday, um, is sort of the, the broad range of perspectives that everybody's bringing um, to, this, to this topic and to this, you know, this webinar summit forum. Um, I do think the state perspective is an important one to have. And again, since it's Colorado, I'm glad um, to be invited to be involved in this. Um, but we're definitely, everyone's kind of coming at this from a, from a different standpoint. And I, I think the, the state perspective is a, is a really value, valued one. And I appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so again, the, the, the topics I'm going to hit on today are sort of an overview of Colorado Parks and Wildlife's tools uh, relative to beaver management. Um, you know, we acknowledge, Parks and Wildlife certainly acknowledges the variety of roles that beavers play including the ecological services um, they deliver on the landscape, which is, which is tremendous. Uh, we also manage for a sustainable harvest um, of these animals. Um, they're a great watchable wildlife species. So managing, that's another one of our goals is managing for, for watchable wildlife. Um, and at times there's conflict with humans and, and, and damage on that side, which is something our agency um, has, to, has to work on as well. So again, our, our broad mission We've got to kind of address these these different uh, you know perspectives on on beavers and beavers management, and I guess I want to I want to kind of go through those um, step by step today. In listening to some of the other states and in some of the conversations and work I've had, um, I think it would be fair to say that Colorado is not um, as far along with maybe staffing and infrastructure um, as some of the states that you heard from. I mean, we don't have um, dedicated hatchery facilities or, or kind of beaver um, washout facilities um, regarding translocations. Our, our staff is, uh, is spread across a lot of different things. And, and I mentioned how beaver, beaver touch on a number of different programs. At this point, we don't have a, a, like a riparian habitat specialist that would have beaver um, or beaver restoration activities you know, directly in their wheelhouse. I think it's fair to say that a lot of our, our beaver work, um, be that management or 
translocation and, and other work is, is done much more on the local scale. Um, and along those lines, we've, we've got a, a full load right now with, with agency priorities, including bringing wolves back to Colorado that, that's got a lot of folks um, working, working pretty hard in, in this sort of in this realm. So um, I, I guess I just want to temper, temper expectations relative to, to some of the other states that have definitely got a bit more of a defined, defined program along those lines. So I want to start off by talking about our, our beaver harvest regulations. Um, in Colorado, we have a very uh, controlled and regulated harvest season. Beavers are designated as fur bearers in Colorado, and we require uh, sportsmen and women to have a small game license and a fur bearer harvest permit, which is new, I'll touch on that in a second, um, or a fur bearer license to take beavers. Um, the season runs from October 1st until April 30th, and legal methods of take include a rifle, shotgun, or a live trap. Um, artificial light at night on private land with landowner permission um, or public land with a Colorado Parks and Wildlife permit that would be issued through a local game warden is allowed. Um, beavers that are caught in live traps under this, this avocational hunting, avocational harvest scenario would either need to be dispatched on site or released on site uh, as opposed to, to moved or anything else. Um, a, a significant limitation, I suppose, on, um, on, on fur harvest tools in Colorado um, is a, a citizen-initiated constitutional amendment from 1996, Amendment 14. Um, and that, that was uh, approved by our voters in 1996, which prohibited certain methods of taking wildlife. This initiative banned foothold traps, cable, cable devices, body gripping traps, and other traps for avocational fur harvest, um, meaning just the live traps that you, many of you are familiar with, Hancock Bailey live traps, would be legal for avocational um, fur harvest. And this, this restriction definitely contributes to, to the, the low avocational harvest of beavers that we, we see in Colorado, and I'll talk about that here a little bit more. Um, we look forward this spring to having our improved uh, fur harvest estimates, so species that are harvested, fur bears that are harvested. Um, we conduct phone and internet surveys of all folks that have the appropriate license for that category in the spring, at the end of the season. Um, and we've made some changes that will really improve our ability um, to estimate harvest of a number of species, including beaver. Um, I definitely want to acknowledge the, the Colorado Trappers and Predators Hunter Association, our, our local state fur harvest association, that really strongly supported the addition of this new harvest permit. And what this did, this is a $10 permit that is now required uh, beginning this season that started in April of 21. Um, it's required for those that attend, that intend to pursue fur bearers to purchase this permit. And what it allowed us to do was, was much more on the sort of statistical or sampling end of things, where we were able to define our world of fur harvesters for our phone and internet survey that I mentioned in a much better way than we had in the past when anybody that had a small game license, which was many tens of thousands of sportsmen and women in Colorado, could legally take a fur bearer. Um, now we've got that uh, more of a handle on what that group is based on this permit, and I'm expecting uh, fully expect that this spring we'll have much more um, precise estimates on a number of, of species, including beaver. Um, previous to this, beaver harvest, estimated beaver harvest was in the hundreds of beavers in Colorado, not in the thousands. Um, so a relatively, a relatively small number. Um, the, the low pelt value uh, of beavers is, is another factor in that right now. Um, I, looking things up, it looked like between $13 and $15, perhaps, would be the value of a beaver pelt, um, with maybe the highest rated pelts trending towards, towards $20. Um, so echoing what I heard from Corey a little while ago, uh, one sort of suggestion or comment I would have is that um, as we talk about beavers and, and the good things that beavers can do in the landscape, I would, I would strongly suggest focusing, on, focusing less on um, concerns over the contribution of harvest to beaver populations 
and on all the other things we can do with fevers because this is really biologically um, a, a, a small, very, very small impact um, on beaver populations and, and really something I think that um, is, is easy to get lost in the weeds on with, with some folks um, and, and, and not something that's really contributing to this, you know, would be contributing to this bigger conversation of, of what we can do with beaver, you know, across the state of Colorado. So I need to talk a little bit about um, beaver conflict and some of the some of the tools that are available there. Under that uh, 1996 constitutional amendment, there were a few limited exceptions um, that allowed the use of of some pre-existing traps um, for for engaging with with fur bears in conflict or damage situations. Um, the specific 30-day uh, permit that I wanted to mention here um, as it relates to beaver is, is primarily used for commercial crop production and the use of lethal traps could only be used on that particular piece of private property. And the use of those traps may not exceed one 30-day trapping period for the entire year on that particular parcel, which is again a permit that's issued by Colorado Parks and Wildlife through the local district wildlife manager. Um, the owner or the lessee of that private property also has to provide evidence uh, of the damage in the case of beaver to crops. It would apply to, to livestock with other um, some other carnivores as well. Um, would need to provide proof of, of the damage to those crops um, and that other methods had been other methods have been attempted to alleviate that damage. Um, we issue about 30 of those permits annually statewide taking about 60 to 70 beaver statewide annually. So again, this is a very, very small contribution um, relative to, to beaver populations or beaver mortality uh, across the state of Colorado. Um, additionally, there is a, a damage statute, so state law regarding damage on private property from certain species. So if a beaver is causing damage to crops, real or personal property, in this case, real property would be the land and things attached to it like a tree, like trees, um, a person or their agent or the landowner, again, on private property, um, may hunt, trap, or take that beaver um, on, on private lands at any point in the year um, under, that, under that scenario without it being, without a, without a license, without being a related to avocational, avocational harvest. Um, this is a, a great opportunity to acknowledge um, the role that, that private landowners play in, in wildlife management, in this case, beavers. It was um, really nice to hear from, from our wildlife commissioner, Commissioner May, yesterday, talking about the, uh, the great use of beaver on, on his ranch and his property. Um, so we've got beaver all across Colorado. The, the Eastern Plains is perhaps a, a forgotten um, a forgotten area relative to beavers in Colorado. Um, I think Sarah Marshall mentioned it yesterday. The I-25 corridor has, um, we focus sometimes on kind of the higher mountain meadow uh, beaver habitats, but the, the urban complex, the I-25 corridor, Cherry Creek and South Platte and the Pooter, and um, a lot of those drainages have, have significant beaver resources as well, living in, in the urban, in the urban interface. And, and sometimes the challenges there with, with conflict and damage are different. And sometimes it's, uh, it's a, a species that's able to, to do quite well in, in those environments, um, again, based, based on location. But um, just a good acknowledgement and I appreciate the breadth of, of diversity of speakers uh, in the summit in terms of habitat types across Colorado, um, just emphasizing how we've got, we've got beaver um, all across the state in, in, in some of these different different conditions as well. So talk a little bit about uh, relocating beaver, which would be a, another tool um, in the toolbox, the management toolbox. Um, we, Colorado Parks and Wildlife requires a relocation permit for relocating wildlife uh, that are not tree squirrels, cottontail rabbits, uh, or raccoons. So there's probably, uh, I think we can acknowledge there's a bit of beaver movement that's going on um, around the state without, without a permit, uh, but the requirement from the state agency is that uh, 
private landowners or operators that are moving beaver would have a, a permit from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. My understanding is that the number of permits we issue across the state are, are pretty limited, pretty small. Um, it's a pretty small number. Um, but the, the factors that, that we need to consider, and I'm just going to kind of run through them on any kind of relocation permit, and this could be for, for the species that we, we permit that beyond just beaver, um, include looking at the size of the relocation site, uh, the proximity of the site to public lands, the habitat suitability and the potential to support the relocated species, um, and then buffer zones and, and control that might be necessary if, if that relocated species moved beyond you know, the area where it was, um, wildlife health and zoonotic disease concerns, and other appropriate wildlife management concerns. So there's obviously a suite of, uh, of things there that we need to go through. Um, in talking to our, our wildlife health lab folks, um, district wildlife managers in the field that have been involved with, with small scale beaver relocation projects, as well as our aquatic veterinary staff, um, the issues of tularemia, um, a disease in beaver that, that Corey mentioned, um, is definitely real. We've got experiences with certain drainages uh, with a tularemia outbreak where, you know, something like 90% or almost all the beaver in that particular drainage in that season have, have disappeared, have died. Um, so we don't want to do anything that would perpetuate moving tularemia infected beavers between drainages. Um, the aquatic nuisance species, the, the mussel piece um, and, uh, and the snail piece um, is an important thing to think about. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we're in Colorado not set up for uh, facilities to house beaver for any amount of time to, to work through that as, as some other states are. And then chytrid fungus, also uh, something I wasn't you know, necessarily quite as aware of, um, but there are concerns there. I know some states, um, Utah, for instance, has a very um, comprehensive protocol on how to handle beaver that are being moved relative to those, um, those wildlife health, health questions. Um, so yeah, things, things that, we, that we consider that we need to consider there. Um, good for time here a little bit longer. Um, lastly, the, the, pub, the, publication, the, the public education and the increasing tolerance idea, that's another tool in the toolbox we have. And I think Aaron mentioned yesterday uh, through some of the resources on the Colorado Working Groups page, links to some of the Colorado documents, Living with Beaver. Um, we've got a, a, a pretty comprehensive, I believe it was actually created by State Park some years ago, but a, a comprehensive um, pamphlet on beavers, natural history, uh, techniques to, to reduce conflict with humans, um, goes into steps that can be taken there. Um, so increasing uh, both public and private landowner and, and citizen tolerance of beaver is, is something we strive to do through um, presentations from district wildlife managers in, in schools or in the field or in, in talking to, to landowners and talking to citizens. Um, the, the paperwork and the pamphlets we, we provide. Um, I've got examples of, of numerous district wildlife manager and biologists that are involved in, in Gunnison and in Montrose and Northwestern Colorado in a variety of um, local level beaver projects, both at restoration projects and um, facilitating, facilitating movement. I know when I was a biologist here in Fort Collins, um, I assisted with um, moving a couple beaver out of a uh, out of a canal or ditch situation onto a, a state wildlife area where the goal was to increase increase pond um, habitat. So, so working through those um, those fronts, um, we're we're working on on that increasing tolerance piece and educating the public about about the good um, the good things we can do with beaver. Then uh, a couple next steps or or sort of suggestions. I think I mentioned earlier that I, I think um, from uh, at least my suggestion to, to, to this group or to the Colorado Beaver Working Group um, would be to, to focus on, you know, working, working with um, wildlife operators, wildlife nuisance operators that are involved with, with moving beaver. There's a lot of folks um, that are in the, the Trappers Association and may also be professional um, wildlife con nuisance control operators that, that have opportunities to catch beaver and, maybe an opportunity to move them. Again, from our agency standpoint, that requires a, 
a permit and a, another discussion on whether that's the, the right thing to do at that time. Um, but I'd suggest working with those groups, involving them um, on summits or in conversations uh, of this nature, because there might be a lot of, a lot of common ground um, and some leveraging of, of folks that are already doing things in the field um, that, can be, that can be gained there. Um, I think population estimates um, or surrogates for population estimates for beavers are, are a good way to go as well. We talked, we heard about that um, from Sarah and a couple other speakers yesterday. Uh, we don't have uh, a beaver population estimate for Colorado at this moment. Um, it appears to be a species that's, that's fairly common and well distributed around the state. Certainly not in the numbers, it was here 150 years ago, um, but doing well. And there are there's certainly the potential there, uh, certainly for those in this group or others to, to work with potential population estimates or, or using remote sensing uh, and surrogates to, to kind of move, move something there forward there. And then um, we talked a little bit yesterday, right, I chimed in a time or two on the state wildlife action plan um, and the idea that could in, in future, in the next rewrite of the Colorado State Wildlife Action Plan could beavers be featured more prominently. I looked into some things yesterday and um, indeed our plan in theory is from 2015 to 2025, our current existing plan. Beavers are not a tier one or a tier two species in that current plan. They are, however, mentioned uh, numerous times in terms of their contributions to riparian health and the, species, the, the tier one and two species that are in that habitat type. Um, however, I think there's um, certainly a willingness to look at in the rewrite um, what role beavers might play in terms of uh, being an elevated species there. Um, that process is actually gonna be maybe happening a little sooner than, than thought. Um, I think the, the goal would be to have the plan developed, finalized, and beginning to be implemented in 2025, which actually might mean work would begin on that um, in the next couple of years. So that's another great place to, to plug in um, and see what could go on there. As we talked about earlier, with that state wildlife action plan prioritizing or, or involving a species like beaver or any other species, that may offer opportunities for uh, raw wild money, federal money and funds that, that might be coming in relative to what species are prioritized in the in the swap. Um, I think to make sure Brian uh, Sullivan's got a little bit of time, I will um, step down and, and have some questions. This picture to the right here, I've got a question for all of you beaver experts. Um, when I was doing my master's in the White River, east of Meeker, I came across this beaver under this aspen tree and took this picture. No better place that I could use this picture than, than with this group. And I guess my question for the group is, is this a situation where this beaver cut the aspen down on itself? Or was there a, an angry spouse or a, a partner that actually cut the, cut the tree down on top of this beaver and it just couldn't get out of there in time? So I'm, I'm seriously interested in anyone's input on uh, how often you found that scene in your travels and uh, your thoughts on, on who might be responsible for that. So with that, I will stop sharing and hand it over to, uh, to Brian.